a scripture the Lord's given me. I don't know whether he wanted me to give it if a message was given or not, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. The message wasn't given, so I'll give it to you anyway. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Hallelujah. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Could we just praise Him? Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, glory to God. We thank you for that fellowship, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you for that fellowship. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> For that fellowship which thou hast does not hinge upon thyself, but it comes from that generation that was formed by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. When they got together and they said, let us make man in our own image, that we may have union and fellowship together. And yea, the Holy Spirit of God yearneth even this evening that his people might unite their hearts together in true fellowship and in true love. For yea, this was the message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that we should love our brethren as ourselves, uh, and that we would unite ourselves together and bind our hearts together so tightly joined that there would be no interference from the world. So stay close to the Lord. Let that love and that fellowship that's generated when the people of God come together, let it be meat and drink to your heart. Let God, your Father, strengthen you even this night for that which thou hast to face tomorrow. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 I tell you, if nothing else ever got done tonight but fellowship like this, I think plenty was accomplished. But I think in every service we need to have the Word. And I think the Word puts the cap on good fellowship. Can you say amen? If you have your Bibles, turn back, please, with me to last week's text or the week before, the sixth chapter of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6.
In our last Bible study, we began a study on how should we intercede in prayer. And we only got through just the first point of my study for that particular night. We are to pray to God. Whenever we say we're to pray to God, we have three applications. When we pray to God, we can pray to God the Father, we can pray to God the Son, or we can pray directly to God the Holy Spirit. And we taught you that there are three reasons, many reasons, but we tried to bring it into three categories why we should pray to these different personalities of God. And if you remember correctly in your notes, if you took notes that we, we taught that we pray to the Father for wisdom, for knowledge, for that knowledge that we can't find on this earth, for the word of wisdom, for the word of knowledge. I believe tonight God was speaking to our hearts. I believe he wants to remind us, even though we, we don't need to be reminded, really. We hear it all the time. But yet I think we do, because we forget so easily. We need fellowship. We need to get together. We need to attend church. That's where you get strength. And I believe that Bible, the scripture the Lord gave me in St. John. But if we walk in the light, in the word as he is in the light... Then we have fellowship, one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, constantly cleanses us from all sin. And I added that word constantly, but I believe it's applicable there. I believe that as long as we stay in Jesus, I believe the blood of Jesus is constantly covering us, washing us. How many believes that? I believe it. The Bible talks about that fountain. And I hear the song, the songwriter said, that fountain filled with blood constantly overflows and flows from Calvary's brow into my sinful body and life. Keeps me clean, strong before the Lord. So there's times when we need to pray to God the Father. And then there's times when we needed to pray to Jesus Christ. And, and maybe uh, last week or the week before, if you weren't here, quickly we say, there are times when you should pray to Jesus and to Jesus only. Because the Bible says there's power in the name of Jesus. Uh, and he's the healer. Jesus Christ, by his stripes, you are healed. And I made this mention, and you'll find it to be true. I'll never pray for anybody and anoint anybody without first saying, I anoint you in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ of Nazareth because he is that avenue by which healing comes you may need to be delivered from satanic power any type of deliverance do it in the name of Jesus there's power in that name then there are times when we have to pinpoint the problem and we have to go to the Holy Spirit and I used the song Illustration in my last study. Uh, Come, Holy Spirit, I need thee. The songwriter was talking directly to the third person of the Trinity. He was saying, Come, Holy Spirit, I need you on a personal basis. I need you to come. What for? I need you to come for personal power. I need you to come for personal comfort. I need you to come for a personality within a personality that'll make me what I'm not. Help me to be what I should be. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to pray when we don't know what to pray for. And I use the scripture, and if you don't mind, I'll reiterate that scripture to you as we begin to go into our new section tonight for tonight's studies. In Romans chapter 8, 26 and 27, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for, as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit of man and is able to search out the mind of man and to take those thoughts uh, that we're unable to convey and carry them to the throne room, mister, and present them before God. That's how prayers get answered. Aren't you glad for intercessory prayer? Glory to God. Glory to God. Tonight, 
I start on the part two of our study that we began two weeks ago. How should we pray? And in chapter six of Matthew, tonight I want to uh, bypass verses one through eight because that more or less covered what I taught last week. It says not to, to go out and pray in front of a bunch of people just for them to see you but to go into your secret closet and to get a hold of the one you need to get a hold of. I already taught you that. Either God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. Get down to business when you pray. Make it mean something. Secondly, we are to pray for His will to be accomplished in everything. Notice what the Scripture says in verse 10 of our chapter. It says, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I'm so glad that that was installed within this prayer that Jesus Christ put together for his disciples. It's nice to know in an age, I got a letter, and if I'm free to say this, I, I hope I don't offend anyone by this, but there is a lot of teaching going around about, uh, and I've said a few things about this before, but I want to say a little bit more tonight because it's important about prosperity. How many's heard about the prosperity doctrine? I'm so glad that Jesus Christ himself put that word, my will, in the very prayer that he taught his disciples. There's a doctrine being put out by so-called Pentecostal people today that if you're not healed, that if you can't pay your bills, that if you can't do this or you can't walk, that it's because you're not right with God or because you're so debased that you don't have enough faith to stand before God and be worthy. Mister, let me tell you, none of us are worthy. None of us have enough faith. Not a one of us. There's not a one of us ever will have enough faith. You say, Pastor, where's that in the Bible? Let me tell you, the Bible says, hold one another up. There ain't a man in this church that can move his life any way he wants to. And I don't care how much faith he says he has. It takes the body of Christ to make the hand well. It takes the body of Christ to make the leg well. It takes the body of Christ to make the nose well and the mouth well. And without it, mister, the body will deteriorate and crumble. I'm glad that he instilled it. And I'm not free to say the people who say it. I wish I could. But I wrote a letter. A minister, one of our Assembly of God ministers, wrote me a letter this week among all the other ministers in the Eastern District. And this thing is corrupting our new converts. And people are losing out with God because they're being told they're not worthy. They're not getting healed because they're not worthy. They're not getting this because they're not doing the right thing. I'll tell you something, mister. My Bible tells me, thy will be done. And I'll stand on that as long as I live. And if I should die tonight, I'll say it must be the will of God. And I'm not saying that it's right for us to accept death. I'm only saying the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to do it. Amen. And whenever God says it's time, let's do it. I walked into a lady's room yesterday and Brother Bennett was with me. Sister uh, Vinnie Radcliffe. That woman is deteriorating away. They took a toe off. Then they took a foot off. Then they took one leg off. Then they started with the next toe and the next foot. Then the next leg. She has no legs now. Her arms are going numb. No circulation. It'll be her arms next and pretty soon she'll be a stub laying there. It would be nice for me to walk in there 83 years old and, and say in the name of Jesus in spite of what God wants you get up on those stubs and walk. But I prayed. I'll tell you what I prayed yesterday. I said it's appointed unto man to have 70 years. If he has more than that it's been a gift. Well, that's the Bible. That's not my words now. That's the Bible. 
And I said, God, and Brother Bennett will remember it, have your will. Have your will accomplished in this woman. Only one thing I want you to do, God. If you so direct a healer, I know you can heal her and raise her out of this bed in the name of Jesus. But if your will says, and I didn't say it this way so that she could, in her subconscious condition, understand what I was saying. But in a roundabout way, I told God in that prayer, if you want her, she's ready. Don't let her suffer, God. If you want her, have mercy upon her and take her home. Now, maybe it's hard for you to understand. Maybe you don't understand it tonight. But I'll tell you, I'd much rather know instead of stepping out on some far-fetched limb and taking the Bible and unbalancingly accepting it, I'd much rather say, God, I want to be in the center of your will. Whatever you want, for me, I want it. And nobody will, everybody knows, I, nobody believes in healing more than I do. We've had a lot of healings right in this church, and I believe God's able to raise the dead. I have no doubt in my mind if God told me. I'm not going to go. I preach funeral after funeral. God's never told me to walk up to the casket and lay my hand on that corpse and say, come alive. If he tells me to, I will. But not until he tells me to. And I think it's important for us to get our perspectives, our, is it perspectives? Right. Get our priorities where they belong, even in doctrine. You can use good scripture but you can still distort doctrine. Yes, Yes, sir. See what I mean? I've had that happen. How many other people have had that? I've had that happen before. I've seen families. Do you know that it's possible? You just took words out of my study tonight, brother, because I was going to say this. Do you know, folks, that you can not only speed up the hand of God, but you can slow down the hand of God by prayer? Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, if people get to praying, God will have mercy. But it isn't always for the good of that person. We see something and we want it, and none of us want to see anybody die. There's none of us here want to. I didn't want to see my mother die. That man didn't want to see his mom die. But thank God they're in heaven. Isn't that wonderful, brother? <laughs> Hallelujah. There's nothing any better. They're walking the throne of God. They're in the praises of the Lord. They're in better rest than I'll ever experience on this earth. It was their time. I believe the will of God was accomplished, even though it hurt our hearts so bad. I believe there are times when we can't see beyond the will of God. We only see what we'd like. So thus it deters the will of God. Everybody know what I'm trying to get? The will of God. I could preach a whole night on that thing. But I just want you to know, folks, I believe in prosperity. I do. I believe God's able to fill your pocketbook, but not the way one man tried to do it to me a couple months ago. Sent me a letter and said, if you'll send me a $20 bill, I'll put it in a brand new wallet for you. And I'll pray over that wallet, and then I'll keep the $20 bill and send you the wallet, and God will fill that wallet for you. It took everything I had to keep from taking a big blank piece of paper, putting it inside that, and putting on the end of it, baloney, and sending it back to him. And people yet are so gullible. They'll eat that up. Folks, let's get our eyes on Jesus. Brother, get your eyes on Jesus. And I'm not saying that everything these people teach is not true, because it is. I'm saying it's unbalanced. I'm saying they're making the Christian look like he's filthy. If he doesn't get healed, he's filthy. That's not true. St. Paul carried something around 
and I'm not going to stand here and debate it, so don't start it. He carried something around. There was something wrong the entirety of his ministry. And there wasn't a man on earth had any more power with God than Paul. Jesus Christ himself had to go to the cross and die. And he was the son of God. Who am I that I should not suffer just a little for the name of Jesus' sake? Just a little. Well, I've got to get off of that subject. Remember, we are to pray for his will to be accomplished. And if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 25... lost my place back here. Let me put that there. Matthew chapter 25. I want to read from verses 31 through 46 very quickly for you because this is part number three of our study. We are to pray for the coming of the kingdom. And in verse 10 of chapter 6, Jesus himself told his disciples. Now again, I, I'm including this in intercession. Remember, I'm not teaching on just prayer. I'm teaching on intercession. You say, Pastor, you mean I'm supposed to intercede for the coming of the kingdom? Yes, sir. I believe when we get our minds on the kingdom of God, we'll start living for the kingdom of God. I have my ear clearing that thing if I keep a listening for your amens there. Notice what it says in verse 10. Thy kingdom. Now notice back here in verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Notice in verse 10. Thy kingdom Come. That's a direct command from Jesus Christ. Pray for the kingdom of God to come. Okay, let's go over to 25 and see what that includes. Verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, that's the kingdom of God as such. We make up the kingdom of God, but when Jesus comes, it shall consummate the kingdom of God. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit of the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, and saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered? And fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these brethren, ye have done it unto me. Jesus was talking right there about the judgment seat of Christ. When every saint shall gather, judged for his works. Then shall he say also unto them of the left hand, which shall happen when, somebody tell me out loud, when shall the left hand be brought to judgment? We had a study on this not too long ago. What is the throne called? The great white throne. That's going to be the last judgment when the left hand, the goats, are going to be brought to judgment for their sin. The dead in sin and those who are alive shall stand before the white throne judgment. And notice what it says here now. Where was I? Somebody help me. 41. Then shall I say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me. Isn't that what it says in, in the book of Revelation? Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me not meat. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? It means that when we were here, we refused to preach and pray the kingdom of God. That's what intercession's all about. You expect and I expect the lost to come into this church. 
Brother, let me tell you, if we don't pray them in, then we won't get them in. Remember that. All the talking you ever do will not amount to a hill of beans if you don't have prayer warriors who are on their knees interceding before the throne. Everybody with me tonight, do you understand what I'm getting at you? That's why they're going to be separated. That's why Jesus, I never saw this before until this study. This is the first time I ever gave this study. I've never seen this thing in the prayer that Jesus gave the disciples. But Jesus really covered a lot of territory in that prayer. He covered every part of the Bible. Every single part of it. In that small prayer. And every bit of it's backed up in Scripture. I was a stranger and you took me not in. Verse 43. Naked and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them and say, Verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not for one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. The right hand facet. The right wing. What does this say? But the righteous shall go into life eternal. I want to be ready, don't you? And if I get this scripture right in chapter 6, it says if I want to be ready. I don't think I'm going too far here in saying this. If I want to be ready and be effective while I'm being ready then I've got to pray intercessory prayer for the coming of the kingdom. That means I've got to get involved in this last day revival. This last day revival. That doesn't mean coming to church and saying hallelujah. That means getting out and inviting people to church, praying for the lost, getting the word out. Putting legs to that intercession. Glory to God. I appreciated Brother Headley's, everybody's testimonies. Brother Headley said he appreciated the older folks so much. He said he respected them for what they stood for. And we younger folks like Brother Headley and me, we can go out and we can visit and do all these things that need to be done. But God can use some of our, our elderly folks on their knees before the Lord. Because they know how to pray. <laughs> they know how to intercede. We can bring the coming of the kingdom closer and closer. How many is anticipating the coming of the kingdom? Glory to God. That's intercession, mister. And I believe if there's anything, we'll move the hand of God on the coming of the kingdom. I believe intercessory prayer will. That's what my Bible says. Pray for the coming of the kingdom. The more you pray, the closer it is. Yes. How many believe that? I do. I believe it. <clears throat> I don't know what that is. It feels like a, a bull in there instead of a frog. <clears throat> <clears throat> Could uh, maybe somebody get me a drink. I, I don't think I'm going to get over this one. My Adam's apples just about wound up with it. Whatever it is there. In chapter 25, in chapter 25, it tells us, as we pray for the coming of the kingdom, it includes the day of judgment. It includes the separating of the sheep and the goats. It includes the eternal life for the righteous and everlasting hell and damnation for the lost. You say, Pastor... I don't think I like the idea of praying for people to be lost. Let me say something to you. You know what the Bible says about it? The Bible says not to cast your pearls before swine. I believe there's an amount of time when you're to give the gospel. I think there's an allotted time when you're to, to spend time with a certain person. And then you're to turn them over to the Lord. 
Thank you, brother. What would happen, and I used to do this, I wouldn't get very far here as a pastor visiting people if I went back and visited every week some of the people that have promised me to come. I'll probably be visiting from now to doomsday. As long as God lays that on my heart, I'm to go. But one time or another, God's going to say, okay, I draw the line. There's somebody over here that needs you worse. Follow through. So this is a balanced thing where you have to find the will of God. Our visitation committee is right in the middle of this thing, and that's why it's important that they pray before they ever go out because you got to know where God wants you to go. You have to feel the urgency of the hour. Who really needs you the worst? I was running down the road today with Brother Morris. We had left the house this morning intending only to go to the hospital and see one man. And we ended up, I don't know how many stops we made. Every time I'd go down the road past somebody, the Lord would say, you ought to stop. I'd say, Brother Morris, do you care? Well, no, brother, I don't care. It's you I got all day. I got all day. And so we'd stop. And, you know, we really had a chance to minister several times for the Lord. The young Craver, used to be a Craver girl that married Brother Helmick. Last night he had a car wreck. Two drunks hit him head on. Just mashed his vehicle all to pieces. The chest broke a steering wheel, but God brought him out of it. And we stopped this morning and ministered to him just a few minutes. And uh, Sister, uh, what's that lady down on Route 100, off of Route 100? That young girl, I can't remember her name. You told me, honey. Garlitz, Sandy Garlitz, little girl. My heart went out to that little thing. Arm busted out of the socket. Little girl screamed for hours until they could get it back in place. Doctor said there was nothing they could do for her. She was out of her head screaming. She said it didn't go numb like a broken arm. And so that little eight-year-old girl just screamed at the top of her lungs as her arm was clear out of place at the elbow. My heart went out to that little young'un. But you know, that's the ministry of the kingdom of God. And when we left that place, I think Brother Morris felt the same way I did. We felt like we had soothed the hurt a little bit, you know. We had got together and prayed in the name of Jesus. And, and mom felt much better, much better knowing, in fact, her words were to me, thank God somebody cares. There's a million and one people in this world today that would love for somebody to show them just a little bit of concern. That's our job. I must hurry. I've been teaching way too long already. We're going to close in a moment. I haven't even got through with this page. I'm going to try one more division here. Number four, we are to pray for our daily necessities in intercession. That's our obligation. The Bible says it. I want you to follow with me here in verse 11 of chapter 6. It says, give us this day our daily bread. This was Jesus' own command to his disciples. Don't you catch yourself begging bread the Bible even says in many passages and in one particular that God will not allow his people to go begging bread Jesus says seek me for your daily necessities if somebody offers you something you best take it tell you a little story here. Two weeks in a row now, Brother Ron and Brother Bennett. By the way, Brother Headley, I'll be getting with you. If you'd like to do visitation, I'm going to take you with me one day. Okay? Some of these other minors here. Brother Brother Howard, and some of these guys. I'm going to take them with me. I took three already. Brother Santucci, Brother Ron, and Brother Bennett. Two weeks in a row. I don't know what it is with Brother Ron and Brother Bennett, but I barely got Brother Ron home two weeks ago, and the wheel bearing went out of my truck just in time to park it right in front of Brother Wes's door. And I left it. This week, 
I mean, we run over awful roads, that old pickup, and it was uh, bouncing around and tearing around. I was doing the tearing, it was doing the bouncing. And, and Brother Bennett was holding on with both hands. <laughs> I think a couple times he really was praying hard. But you know, God kept us safe. I got him home, and I noticed when I stopped, I said, that tire looks like it's getting low. Do you know that tire had separated? I guess I hit the one of those deep ones way, way too hard. And uh, we rode all day. And when I got that thing home and got out of the truck and walked up to the house and looked back, it went pew. God kept that thing two weeks in a row. So let me tell you, you pray and you get a hold of God. And I ask God every day when I go on visitation, because I don't know whether to trust the old truck or not. Uh, Brother Mason, that's not speaking much for it. I'm not helping on the sale part of it, but uh, it's a pretty good old truck. But still, I, I worry sometimes. Uh, somebody's wanting to buy it, and that's not helping on the sale of it. But, but um, got to be honest with you, sometimes I do have second thoughts when I go out in the old thing. But God never lets you down. Can you say amen? He never lets you down. He stays with you 100%. And that's why I think it's important Jesus gave his disciples. He says you don't have to stack up everything in your rear door and have everything ready. If you can do that, fine. But he says, let me tell you something, gentlemen. He said, the kingdom of God comes first. And he says, when your necessities come up, you pray for them and God will provide them. That's why I preach it. And I always will preach it. Put God first. I'll guarantee you he'll never let you go hungry. He'll never let you go hungry. In closing. We're to pray daily for daily forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I can't go to bed at night unless I've asked Jesus to forgive me of my sin. I can't rest. Because I don't know what would happen if I would have committed a sin that day. Well, I do know what would happen. You know, I had a pretty good doctrinal argument with a man one day about this. He said, you can't tell me that a man that has lived for the Lord all his life and then committed one little sin and went to bed and went to sleep without getting it covered with the blood, if he's committed sin and not asked God to forgive him, wouldn't go to heaven. I said, sir... I said, I believe that no sin will enter heaven. I find no place in the scripture where any sin will enter heaven. And if that sin in your life is not covered with the blood, then if that sin's in your life, you nor the sin are going to enter. But if I pray at the beginning of my day, Jesus, I'm, I'm fallible. I make mistakes. I do this because I know I do. Jesus, you walk with me. And I want your blood to cover me today. I want you to walk with me and cover me today. I believe. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but I believe that fountain I spoke to you about. Jesus knows my innermost needs more than I he knows my mistakes. He knows my weaknesses. And I believe if I plead the blood at the beginning of my day, that that blood is available to me all day long. All day long. Now that's pretty straight. But that's the way I live. I can't go to bed at night feeling like there may have been a possibility. I know there's a lot of doctrinal things that go with that. But I'm not going to take the chance. Jesus told his own disciples, he says, pray daily for forgiveness. Daily. It was important to Jesus, and it's important to me, mister. I want to be ready. Every head bowed, just a moment. We're going to be touching on this subject probably the week after next on what hinders prayer. 
There are a lot of things that hinder prayer, but tonight I'm going to touch just briefly on this. A lot of times we get in the mood to pray. You know, we can get spurty. Today we're real religious. Tomorrow we're just as cold as a cucumber. That's the way the human likes to work. But you know, that doesn't work with God. I believe it's important that when we get a desire to pray, that we make sure that we're in a position to pray. I believe our hearts have to be right with God. John chapter 15, and one of the brethren in our church and I have talked about this chapter many times. John chapter 15. It tells you some of the requirements for effective prayer. And I'll tell you, folks, tonight my prayer to my Jesus is that not only that I be an intercessor for this town and for this church, but that I be an effective intercessor, one who has obeyed the word and the policies of God. Jesus Christ wants that and nothing more or nothing less from you or I. We're going to stand in just a moment, but I'm going to pray first. And we're going to gather just for a moment around the altar and ask Jesus to make the importance of intercession at home real to our hearts. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I know it's the desire of every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl in this church to be used of the Lord in one way or another. Sometimes people have jobs where people can see. Other times people have jobs in the church that are unseen because they do it at home, like prayer and intercession and reading God's word and studying. God, I pray that whatever our job, may we never leave out the fact if there ever was a day we need to intercede before the throne, it's today. You instructed your disciples in chapter 6 of Matthew. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven. And you said, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. Our trespasses. As we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Tonight, Jesus, if there's anything in our lives that would interfere with us getting a hold of the throne, I ask you to remove it. Wash us afresh in your precious blood. Forgive us of any word we've ever said out of character. Any place we've ever gone that is out of character. Any motive we've ever had that could have been misleading. Any intention, God, that could have caused someone to stumble. I ask you tonight, Lord, that you'd forgive us and make us usable material for the Son of God. Humbly, I ask that as a pastor, Lord. In Jesus' name. Could you stand with me? Maybe we could just take advantage of this altar for a little bit tonight. Don't like to leave the service without prayer. Would you come? Let's gather around. And Jesus has something special for you. Maybe the old closet at home been a little cold. Why don't you ask Jesus to warm it up a little? Draw us closer to him. Will you come tonight? God bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> <clears throat>
comes from. Oh, when we get alone with the Lord, we begin to intercede. We get down to business with the Lord our God.